that was your fun. So we could have special, a, a series of special speakers come and meet with students, faculties, and the community. And the Mandel Endowed Speaker Series has brought us a number of guests. I think our, our last live one uh, was John Meacham, the historian. Uh, so now we're going to resume today. And to introduce our, our guest, I'd like to welcome Ambassador Bobby Mandel. Uh, finally, introduce uh, today's guest. Man, has been in the news a great deal lately, uh, offering excellent insight into the war in Ukraine. A New York City native and graduate of Rice University at NYU, our speaker was primarily trained as a writer. He did the magazine's job at the Wilson Center, which I worked at for a while, and he worked, he worked with the uh, Congressman Lee Hamilton. Supporting work and later drafting reports of the 9 11 Commission in the Iraq Civil War. From 2009 until 2017, he served as Deputy Advisor and Special Security Advisor to President Obama. In that capacity, he participated in nearly all of President Obama's key decisions uh, in national security communications, speech writing, public diplomacy, and global engagement programs. He was involved with the raid on the Laden's compound. Arab Spring, he negotiated, helped negotiate with Russia and China, and played an active role on all these issues as well as other critical administration. He also led the secret negotiations with the Cuban government, which resulted in normalization of an effort to normalize relationships between the United States and Cuba, and supported negotiations to conclude the joint comprehensive plan of action. He's the author of the New York Times bestsellers, After the Fall, Being American in the World in the Age, and the World as, as It Is. He's a contributor to NBC News, to MSNBC, and Crooked Media. He's co chair of the National Security Action and still an advisor to the former president of the Obama. Use the mic. Yes. Yeah, use the mic. Um, so um, I will. Uh, I'll make some, you know, some opening comments here, uh, and then uh, sort of questions. Um, and I wanted to focus a little bit, obviously, on Russia at the outset here, um, given everything that's going on. Um, and and I thought the way I would do this to take it beyond kind of the news of the day is um, is something that ties into my last book, uh, which is called After the Fall, where um, I really set out to kind of examine why the world was moving in what felt like the, the wrong direction uh, after the Obama election. And I, I'd start just with how I got into this because it, it started with uh, an experience with, with Russians. Um, so there I am uh, after eight years in the White House and uh, didn't end like I thought it was gonna end. Um, we obviously had the 2016 election, and so I was kind of spit out on the other end of this incredibly intense experience. I, mean, I was 29 years old when I went to work for the Obama campaign in 2007, and I was 39 years old uh, when I kind of uh, dropped Barack Obama off on his final flight in Air Force One with Michelle Obama uh, to California, um, flew back across the country on Air Force One, um, which is not called Air Force One at the present time on, on the plane, and had this very strange experience of being you know, one of five people on what is normally this traveling uh, cavalcade of press and staff and secret service. Um, and it was an incredibly disorienting experience. You know, a lot of those things that are in my bio, uh, the, the successor administration was gonna get right to work taking those things apart. Um, and what was more, I think, troubling to me in a way, though, than that, is that not only did I have a sense at that time of American politics moving in a different direction at that time. But that was kind of the direction of events for women. You, know, you felt this trend of a rising authoritarian nationalist brand of politics that was gaining traction everywhere, um, all parts of the world in different ways. And uh, I was sitting a few months after this in Germany with uh, a young Russian woman named John M. Sobra, um, who had driven several hours to, to meet with me 
um, I was traveling with then former President Obama because um, she wanted our help, but what she really wanted is to tell her story. Um, and this is something you'll find among people that are dealing with incredibly difficult problems in their own countries. Sometimes they just want to talk. Uh, they just want to explain what's going on. And Jana's story is that her father, Horst Nemtsov, had been the chief political opposition to Vladimir Putin for a long time. And he was killed. He was assassinated uh, right outside the Kremlin. So not in a subtle way. In 2014, um, as he was organizing protests against the Russian war in Ukraine. So you know, relevant to the moment we're in now. And um, that conversation became the beginnings of a book in which I tried to tell the story of why we saw this drift towards authoritarian politics around the world through the experiences of different characters who have lived that trend uh, in, their own, in their own lives. And so I'm talking about Russia and China and then about America, and then you know, we'll open it up. Um, so I'll start with John's story, because I think this is instructive. We're all asking ourselves, how did we end up where we are today, uh, where Russia has launched an invasion of Ukraine that is of a scale that we haven't seen in Europe since World War II. And this is going to transform the world we're living in with massive repercussions for not just American foreign policy, but I think for politics generally around the world and, and, and international world. Um, and I think the stories of the Russians I encounter kind of speak to this trajectory that Putin's been on that kind of led inevitably um, to what he's currently doing in Ukraine. So where to begin? Boris Nemtsov was one of those people that was at the vanguard of the democratization of Russia in the late 80s and early 90s. He was a young scientist who opposed the construction of a nuclear power plant where he lived because the recent nuclear disaster in Chernobyl had just taken place. And people didn't want to build more nuclear plants when they just seen one melt down and potentially put tens of thousands of people at risk. And that kind of positioned him as a political figure at the same time that the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, he went into politics, he got elected uh, governor of the region of Russia where he was from. And he was seen as the leading light of a generation of younger liberal politicians who were seeking to kind of remake Russia. And Jean recalls it as this incredibly hopeful time where world leaders would come to visit her dad, you know, as this emblem of the new Russia. Um, they had freewheeling public debates on television. Um, they had very participatory democracy. Um, and it felt like the big questions of history had been answered. Right, um, democracy defeated autocracy, capitalism defeated communism. Um, and Boris Yeltsin, who was president of Russia at that time, even said that Boris Nemtsov would be a successor, that this is the guy who would be the next president of Russia. Um, and ultimately, Boris Nemtsov got brought to Moscow to become the deputy prime minister of Russia in the mid 90s. Now, what's happening at this time? An incredibly chaotic transition in Russia marked by two things that I think are essential to understanding the origin of Putin and where we are today. The first is a deep sense of humiliation. You know, you go from growing up in a country that you believe is one of the two superpowers of the world that has the biggest empire in the world, the Soviet Union, to seeing that all crumble um, within a period of years. Um, and it instilled, I think, in Russians, even Russians who welcomed the, the liberalization of the Soviet Union, this kind of deep feeling of, of humiliation and uh, of, of, of grief. Now, the thing that was supposed to make up for that is a transition to better standards of living. Suddenly we can be free. Suddenly we can access things that we see people have in the West. There's McDonald's on the street, our standards of living will go up. But what happened instead is that all of the resources that the Soviet Union possessed, which were largely natural resources, right? Uh, oil and gas fields, mines, um, and also industry, gets auctioned off to the highest bid. That's how they privatized the Soviet Union. They just said, we're gonna have these auctions, and guess what happens? They're just phenomenally corrupt, because basically 
you pay off the right people, you get access to these resources, you become incredibly rich. And that, if you guys have seen the term oligarch in the news lately, that's the beginning of the oligarchs, right? These guys who basically hang off people, getting all the uh, resources for themselves. And the Russian people are suffering mightily. The 90s were a time of complete chaos in terms of people losing their savings, inflation going through the roof, financial crises. And so there was this building enormous backlash against the 90s era generation of politicians, including Boris Nemtsov, who were associated with this. And even though Nemtsov himself wasn't corrupt, just by association, he gets kind of lumped in with these people. And this is precisely the time that we see the emergence of Vladimir Putin uh, as Boris Yeltsin's actual successor. So who is Putin? He's a KGB guy. He was in East Germany at the fall of the Soviet Union. And so he experiences very personally the sense of humiliation that came with those times. He was literally at the KGB station in Dresden, East Germany, at a time when a mob of Germans is kind of gathering <coughs> outside where he's working, where he used to call all the shots, right? And there was a famous exchange that Putin had with the guy he's working with, where the guy said, well, we have to clear these people out. We've got to call on the local authorities in Germany to get rid of these people. And Putin says, uh, we can only do that if Moscow uh, gives the green light and Moscow's not picking up the phone. You know? And basically, Putin felt abandoned by the system that he's served. He then goes into politics in St. Petersburg. And what he does very skillfully is he both is part of the reaction against the corruption and he's also a part of the corruption, right? So Putin's brand politically at the beginning was, hey, look, I'm the hardworking, gray KGB guy who can restore order, restore stability. Um, but what he's not, not saying is he's also entirely on the table because all of his buddies in the KGB are quite skillful at getting their hands on these massive amounts of natural resources. So he kind of surfs into power to succeed uh, Boris Yeltsin in 2000 both capitalizing on what had gone wrong, the humiliation I talked about, the corruption I talked about, but also he's building his own version of that corruption to sustain himself in power. And Orson Nemtsov's story is kind of the story of the, the tragic failure of the post-Soviet years to deliver for people. And he kind of becomes this perennial oppositionist um, who sticks to liberal democratic principles and is increasingly out of step with the direction of events in Russia all the way until his assassination in 2014. Now, part of what Boris Nemtsov does is he gets involved in Ukrainian politics because that's one place where there is possibility for democracy. So he's a part of protests there. He even served as an advisor to the government there for a time. So you start to see this, this dynamic where Russia is becoming more autocratic and Ukraine, the largest former Soviet republic, is trying to move out of Russia's orbit and people like Nemtsov are trying to support the, the second guy I'll highlight is Alexei Navalny, um, who some of you may uh, have heard of. He's currently, he's the leading opponent to Putin today. He's just got sentenced to nine additional years in prison on top of previous sentences uh, after being poisoned and nearly killed by Putin. Um, I FaceTimed with Navalny for a while in 2020 before he was poisoned. Um, and he walked me through kind of his life his experience in Putinism, which I think speaks to the, the next phase in the early 2000s, which is that Navalny gets into politics in the early 2000s and immediately begins to see the massive corruption of the system that Putin is constructing. Um, Navalny got into politics by protesting essentially real estate deals that were displacing people from their homes and not compensating the poor. And so he'd go to court to kind of sue the people that were doing this. And then he'd find out, as he told me when he got to the court, that the judge was on the table. And then he'd get visited by some Russian mobs who so beat him up for, for, for bringing these lawsuits. And what he then did over the years is he basically became a single-minded anti-corruption crusade. Um, and he did something very clever. He realized that all the money in Russia runs through a small number of oil companies. So he bought a small amount of shares in each oil company and he sued them all. 
so that you could get access to their books. And back in those days, there was still enough of a legal process that you could do that. And what he exposed was tens and tens of billions of dollars were being skimmed off the top of oil transactions in Russia, all going to enrich Putin, his cronies, who then paid that money back into the Russian state coffers and Putin's personal uh, coffers. And, and so essentially, Navalny spent a career exposing like a massive kleptocracy that, that Putin is building, right? And the thing is, for a time, it worked out pretty well for ordinary Russians because in the early 2000s, oil prices were high. That meant that Russia was getting richer, rich enough that people's standards of living are going up, people are getting pensions again, not getting them in the 90s. Um, and so there was enough for everyone. Then the financial crisis happens in 2008. And suddenly the money's not there anymore. Um, I came into government at that time. Putin was prime minister, not president. Kind of took a back seat, he was still calling the shots. But he was happy to be in the back seat in the bond financial crisis with Russian people getting more and more angry about their standards of living beginning to go down. Then Putin returns to the presidency in 2012. What, what does he do in the absence of, of having these resources to spread the money around? He turns towards nationalism. He turns towards much more aggressive autocracy at home. And this is when people like Nemtsov and Navalny start to get arrested and detained, and basic rights start to be uh, rolled back in Russia. But he also becomes much more aggressive in his, in his foreign policy as a way of stirring up and ginning up national sentiment that supports his political project. Um, and you know, Navalny spoke about in 2014 when Russia moved to annex Crimea, the degree to which you know that kind of confirmed for Putin the validation that could come from that brand of nationalist autocracy at home and aggression abroad. Um, and there's a whole side note to how that happened, but in short, what happened is the pro-Russian corrupt president of Ukraine faced massive popular protests. He flees Ukraine, and then Russia just moves in its special forces to this area of Crimea and takes it over. And there's not a fight. It's not like this time. There's no fight. And so Putin takes this lesson, and, and reading my comments uh, from Navalny, they're kind of eerie because he says, Navalny does, the most dangerous thing for Russia has always been the trap of, of empire. It's always what ends up bringing down the system. You build a corrupt system, and then you get overextended in your imperial project. And ultimately, that's your down. Um, and he was literally telling me this in 2020, kind of anticipating in many ways where we are now. Now, the last person I'm going to mention is, is a, a, a chief, uh, one of the most prominent Russian writers who's a critic of Putin, a woman named Maria Stepanova. And she kind of caught me up through um, the last few years. And her point was that the other thing that Putin had obviously seized upon was information. Okay, you've got a big house of cards. You've got a kind of totally corrupt system that you've set up to funnel all the resources to you and your cronies, and you just try to sprinkle them up around the people. You've got this kind of ideology of Russian nationalism and Russian empire and acting on Russian grievances. Um, and then you have American-made social media platforms become the perfect vehicles for disseminating whatever disinformation or propaganda or conspiracy theory is convenient to you. And she described in a really interesting way the experience of living in Russia in the last few years as living in a country of extreme violence, except the violence is all online. It's all about the Ukrainians are Nazis, the Ukrainians are trying to kill us, the Americans are trying to control, you know, QAnon has a lot of origins in uh, Russia. There's cabals of people that are in child sex trafficking um, and people are basically being radicalized in, in the country in a way that's kind of creating its own momentum. This has to lead something. All of these things have to, to lead to something. Um, and Putin himself is a figure that, you know, he'd been in power for 20 years. What is the point? What is the ideology behind it? It's not communism. It's not, there's no system that he exemplifies. Um, it's just the assertion of grievance and the assertion of nationalism and the construction of useful conspiracy theories that get to a point where you don't even know where the truth ends and the lie begins. That's the world in the 
momentum that had been building up in Russia. And it kind of led inexorably to what we're seeing in Ukraine now. Um, this has to find expression in something that we do that is of, of sufficient scale to, to justify the 20 year project of Putinism that had already bitten off chunks of countries around it, um, but now it is seeking, I think, and doomed to fail uh, in, in trying to consume all of Ukraine itself. Um, I think what's important in what I was wrestling with in the book is that Putin was kind of the vanguard of a certain kind of ethno-nationalist, right? Ethnic Russian nationalism, authoritarianism that had a playbook. The playbook is you get to power through an election, then you kind of enrich your cronies, you finance your politics, then you redraw the, the, the parliamentary districts as Putin did in Russia to make sure your party has a, an easier way of, uh, of maintaining power. Then you buy up propaganda networks, television stations to begin with. You launch intimidation campaigns on social media. Um, you know, you, uh, you take over the judiciary of your country by packing the courts with judges who will find in favor of all your power grabs. Um, and you can wrap this whole thing up in an us versus them national. In this case, us, the real true Russians against them. And then Putin, you know, had a shifting cast of characters that he would attack from Muslims in Chechnya to the LGBTQ community in Russia, which was really singled out, to civil society itself as a fifth column for foreign influence. This playbook you've seen kind of migrate around the world um, to, to places as diverse as Hungary or Brazil or the Philippines. I would argue here in the United States, um, which we can get to. Um, and and what, it, what it's doing is it's using the existing openness of globalization to destroy the system from within, you know, um, to basically, we're going to use your technology tools to spread our disinformation. We're going to use your capitalism to hide our ill-gotten wealth. You know, we're going to use your United Nations to give Russia the capacity to obstruct anything the United Nations can do, right? And, and, and that's the, I don't want to say genius because I don't, you know, that, that's what Putin stumbled into is the, the capacity to disrupt. Um, now, the beneficiary of this is actually not Russia. Um, the beneficiary of this is China. Um, and, and, and I'm going to move pretty quickly to this because I want to get to questions. But you know, in the book, I, I, I describe this progression of going to China after it really happened in this Russian story. And you know, I start um, being in Shanghai in 2017. And I was traveling with Obama, and I was in my hotel room, and I got woken up by the phone at like 10 o'clock. It's really dispiriting when you just fall off the jet lag and fall asleep. <laughs> and the receptionist is like, oh, Mr. Rhodes, the vice foreign minister wants to see you now. And I thought that's pretty strange. Like, I'm not in government. It's 10 o'clock at night. Why does this guy want to see me? And I let this guy in my room, and He's with somebody else, kind of this heavy set guy who's just kind of watching the vice foreign minister to see what he does. And after making a lot of small talk, he says, um, Hey, we understand that uh, President Obama is going to India next, um, and he's considering meeting with the Dalai Lama. Um, they don't call him the Dalai Lama, they call him like the terrorist leader of the Tibetan separatists. <laughs> um, and I said, yeah, and he said, this would be horrible, this would offend Xi Jinping, it would offend over a billion Chinese people, we met with this person, blah, blah, blah. The point of the story, though, is that we had not announced any meeting with the Dalai Lama. Um, I'd only been put in email contact with like, the Dalai Lama's representative that day. So this guy was basically saying, hey, we were monitoring your communications. Today, we saw this email exchange you had with this guy. And we're here, we don't care that Barack Obama's down the hall, we're telling you you can't meet with this person even though you're not even in government. And it was a very brazen assertion of a power dynamic that it shifted. You know? um, I don't think 10 years ago that would have happened, right? And I remember walking out and, and, and Shanghai is this incredible skyline. It looks like, you know, a mix of Blade Runner and you know, New York, and it looks like the future, right? And there are all these people there taking pictures with selfie sticks, and it's all this prosperity. Um, and I had this very eerie feeling that, on the one end, this was a very familiar scene. 
it was high tech, it was skyscrapers, it was capitalism, right? It was everything that capitalism can produce. Um, and it felt vaguely cosmopolitan, right? It's young people you know, posting their selfies on Instagram, et cetera. And yet, the experience I just had made every phone feel <laughs> a little threat, you know? Um, it's all these things, but it's not free. It's everything, if you took all of the global order that America built, all the technology, all the wealth creation, all the progress in lifting people out of poverty, but then you just drained all of the democracy out of it, you would get what I was looking for. And it occurred to me that China is not actually an unusual successor to America in terms of being a world power. Maybe it's the natural progression, right? Um, they took a lot of what we built and they repurposed it for their own system. And I mean, just briefly, the, the main area of focus I had in my book was on Hong Kong. I spent a lot of time there. I embedded with some protesters to those of you who followed that movement. What was so fascinating about Hong Kong is it was literally the experiment of what happens when a city of a few million people over the course of a few years goes from being an open society where you can say what you think and access different kinds of information. What happens when it goes from that to just being totally closed up um, and totally kind of swallowed up? And I was talking to people in the middle of that transition. And what they described was very eerie to me. It was like, at first it became kind of known and understood, don't post anything critical of the government on social media because you're not gonna get into school and you're not gonna get a good job. It's, it's all kind of incentive disincentive of the society that's been built. Um, and then gradually that becomes more acute where you can get in trouble if you do that, you know? And it reaches a stage of where they're passing laws where you can't do that. And they bought up all the media and they shut down the independent media and they turned the rest of the media into propaganda. And suddenly you started to get newspapers delivered to your doorstep every day, the Chinese Communist Party line. Suddenly in the schools, you're being made to sing the Chinese Communist Party anthem. You're learning a different version of history than the version of history you learned three years ago. This kind of comprehensive remaking of a society around a totalitarian model that doesn't look like what we think of as totalitarian. You know, it doesn't look like the Soviet Union. It looks like New York City, except you can't say what you think and you can't even really think what you want uh, without it being dangerous. Um, those are the stakes. Uh, in the world right now. Yeah. Um, you've got the Russian kind of old school blood and soil nationalism that leads to war, which is a version of human history that we've experienced. And then you have this kind of much more sophisticated um, brand of kind of techno authoritarianism blended with capitalism um, with, where China's at the bad guy. And so what does that mean for us? Um, and I'll just speak for a few minutes about this because uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions will get into what it's going to us. You know, from a foreign policy standpoint, one of the things that I experienced that was quite interesting during those eight years is American foreign and national security policy is, is, is a machine that is built to do certain things and it does the things that it was built to do well. So the machinery that we inherited when we walked in the door in 2009 was a massive global machinery designed to fight terrorism. Um, that's what budgets were allocated for. That's what the United States was doing ostensibly um, in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, and many other countries. Um, and the Obama years were an effort, and not an easy one, at trying to repurpose, rebuild, and steer that ocean line in a different direction. Realizing, oh my gosh, like this is the wrong, we're focused on the wrong problem. Like terrorism is a problem, but relative to what I just talked about, like terrorism is not what's going to define the future of the world. You know, a few thousand terrorists that concern us in the Middle East and North Africa are not of a scale of concern that China or Russia or these kind of structural forces are. So in the Obama years, you know, that was how do we disentangle ourselves from these conflicts <coughs> while keeping our eye on terrorism? But how do we then begin to outline a world in which America is focused on climate change, which is a defining aspect of our lives? Um, and that leads to the Paris Agreement. How do we avoid the next war in the Middle East? And 
that leads to the Iran nuclear deal, which is about avoiding a war and avoiding the spread of nuclear weapons. How do we kind of close the old accounts and try new ways at, at advocating for our values? And that was the, the Cuba uh, mobilization that I was a part of. And recognizing I'm in Florida, realize that there's probably diversity of views about that. Um, but it was all about essentially kind of repositioning American <coughs> foreign policy to deal with the actual problem set in the world, the, the priorities that we have to be focused on. Um, um, what I, of course, was forced to reckon with after the Trump election in writing this book and everything I've been doing since, and I interact a lot with kind of activists around the world, is that I don't think the, the answer to any of the things I've talked about will be solved by American foreign policy. These are all things that we have to solve in our own democracies. The dysfunction, division, um, and, and danger, really, uh, of the survivability of multiracial, multi ethnic democracy in this country is directly connected to the other problems I've talked about. Because Putin has exploited the absence of like a strong, fortified, democratic world. He's tried to create divisions. He's taken advantage of social media platforms that are unregulated. He's taken advantage of, of really unequal economic systems that make it perfectly normal for a Russian billionaire oligarch to steal money and then hide it in offshore accounts. He's, he's again, he's burrowed into the system and found the weak points as a lot. The people were always asking for years about the 2016 election interference. And the, the sad reality was, all he did is take advantage of pre-existing divisions. He didn't invent them, he just turbocharged them, right? And, and so our vulnerability as a democracy, you know, it manifests itself first and foremost in terms of like our capacity to solve problems here. But it, it, it also has facilitated the autocrats going on all of us. Um, because frankly, a lot of the same problems are present in other democracies, whether they're Europe or Asia or Latin America or Africa. Um, and so the, the fortification of our own democracy, both in terms of, by the way, basic things like can you vote? And if you vote for one candidate and that candidate wins, will that candidate actually become the, the, the person who holds office? Yeah, that, that's the basics. But I'm, I'm saying beyond that, what are we doing about technology? What are we doing about disinformation? Why do so many Americans believe things that aren't true? Like, what is our approach to that? Or how do we have a approach to capitalism that doesn't make people feel like the whole system is so rigged anyway, that they might as well just vote for someone who reflects their grievances. Because that's what I found in country after country. If people have given up. They didn't think the system was fair. If you don't think the system is fair, then you might as well have the strong man who like, at least speaks to your sense of grievances. It doesn't justify it, but it is what we're dealing with. And so part of this is fortifying our democratic example. And then on the China side, part of this is like, I'm not somebody, despite like the kind of warning I, I, I'm delivering, who wants this to translate into some like Cold War military style competition in China. I do think that there's a major profound competition of how our society is going to be organized in the 21st century. Is artificial intelligence married to social media and, and infinite monitoring capacity going to be used? as it is right now in Western China, to build the kind of perfect surveillance state uh, on the Chinese Uyghurs, or is it gonna be used to solve climate change? Like these are huge questions, right? And we as a democracy are not answering them uh, because of our own divisions, our own fights here at home. Um, and, and because we see too much of a distinction between domestic policy, and foreign policy, or because we have these massive swings from one president to the next, we have to have the capacity to defend and fortify democracies themselves um, and then figure out how democracies can have better solutions to the problems that people have than the model that the Chinese Communist Party is putting forward that could be attractive to some people or the sense of grievance politics that Putin represents that can also be attractive to some people. It's ultimately about like, who we are, what we believe, and what we want it to mean to be American has to be the source of, of how we solve other problems. The note I'll end on is I think that this, people have sensed this kind of rudderless nature of the democratic world. They've sensed a lack of leadership, a lack of relevance, a, a lack of potency. 
I think that this is entirely what, to those who have been consuming the news in Ukraine, this is what Volodymyr Zelensky is happening. The reason I think he's kind of caught such fire is that like, he's a leader in a t-shirt surrounded by his people, you communicating with the world in the same way that you guys. He's not sitting at the end of a very large table, you know? Or he's not even saying by the podium wearing a tie. Like, he's, he's a recognizable figure. He's generational. He's exactly my age, which feels old, but I know uh, uh, to you, but still feels kind of young to me. Um, <laughs> um, but more than that, he's a populist. But the populism isn't about grievance alone, or it isn't about nationalism alone. It's, it's about community and, and values. And he's basically saying... Every time he pipes into a parliament and shames somebody, you guys are not living up to the words you say. You guys carve these words on the walls of memorials in places like the United States about equality and democracy and opportunity. Are we living up to those words? He's identifying the gap between what we, the stories we tell ourselves in the world about who we are and the lived reality. Um, and that's an incredibly powerful thing. Um, that he's happened to. And, and, and I think that this is going to therefore be a kind of transformative period. Our democracy is going to get their act together in response to what has happened in Ukraine or with the passage of time are we going to get back consumed with our own petty differences <laughs> and disinformation campaigns, right? I think the stakes are enormously high. Um, when my book came out, a lot of people were like, the criticism was, this is pretty dark. Um, but it's like, hey, you know, sometimes you got to open the window to look at what the weather is. Um, this is the world we're currently in. I remain hopeful that people would rather live in free and open societies. I took that away from Hong Kong because they had the choice and they tried to opt out. Um, but we're only going to get there if, if we start here. So I'll stop there and happy. It's very fun. <laughs> and that, that great uh, overview. We had a, uh, a number of very good questions uh, that were presented before the uh, event. So I'm going to try to synthesize those because we have guys come in and I want to make sure we hit on some of the key points. Um, you've spoken a lot in Florida, so I know this question will come as a real surprise. It's not me, which is cute. Uh, you were the point person in negotiating with. Raul Castro's government on normalizing relations. And you said the rational in your book, you said it probably the rationalization for that was, of course, that the sanction regime had at work, forcing the change of government, and the proximity and open, openness was likely to result in change. At the same time, you talked about Russia and China just now. Uh, those countries have used openness to Western, to uh, international commerce and technology and adapt in a way that actually preserves the regimes that are in place. So I'd like you to, to tell us a little about what you think of the uh, Cuba policy that President Obama pursued looking, looking back on it. Um, sure. Um, so the basic rationale of the policy, right, is there, there are two things, or well, there's several things that are concerning about 65 years of pursuing a policy that I think has completely failed to meet its objectives. Um, what is the state of life in the Cuban people? And it's terrible. It is a degree of poverty that should not exist. Not only 90 miles from the United States, but you know Cubans, like they, they can do extraordinary things. Um, and, and some of that is because of their own government, obviously. But some of that is, you know, you have to visit to see for yourself, what the embargo is doing. It's just, they're cut off from the world. <coughs> Second, the political system provides no rights and no sense of, of empowerment to people. Those two things are connected, by the way, because if you close off the whole country, and you basically put it under a dome, and you say you can have no interaction with the rest of the world, it's a much easier society for an autocratic regime to control than one that is circulating uh, with the rest of the world. 
Um, and then there's just the matter of foreign policy, and, 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 and Cuba obviously hasn't been as massive here to in North America for us, this kind of ideological competition that, that nobody ever wins that goes on in the Our basic approach, our basic debt was that if you opened up uh, Cuba to not just diplomatic relations with the United States as a starting point, but if Americans are traveling there, if, if we pushed internet access and internet connectivity um, really hard, uh, if, if, if you're strengthening the Cuban private sector, the country for and you're starting to start small businesses there, you will, number one, immediately improve the livelihood of Cuba. So life will get better as a humanitarian perspective as, as that connectivity is picking up. But then over time, you're going to introduce new ideas to people in Cuba. You're going to introduce new points of connection to people in Cuba. Um, and, and that's going to be much more likely to bring about change, political change than just the kind of status quo of sealing this place off and issuing <coughs> thundering denunciations from Washington. Um, I think it was bearing out. You know, what I always hear down here is that it's been two years, they haven't changed. I'm like, okay, first of all, you guys tried the other way for 65 years. Second of all, things are changing. If you went down to Cuba, you could feel a change. The, the private sector was growing. There was more interconnectivity in the rest of the world. The, the cultural expression, political opposition wasn't just manifesting itself in dissidence, it was manifesting itself in reggaeton, in hip hop, in art. Like, and frankly, that led to the protest movement we've seen these years. Um, and this all gets rolled back um, under Trump and, and among other things, really deflated the expectations of people. Um, in terms of the question of like, well, look at China, Russia, they could, they could take the, the, you know, the capitalism or take the openness and keep the repression. I would say that China, Russia, Vietnam are not 90 miles apart, and they're very big countries. Cuba's capacity to maintain that system in this proximity to America with this difference in size and scale, I just don't believe that. And why are we confident enough to believe that if more Americans are traveling there and there's more information there, and why don't we have the confidence to think that that would lead to change? That if Cubans could experience that kind of activity, experience the entrepreneurship that was developing in that private sector, that could experience the other ideas that would come from people staying in. I mean, we just literally shut down the sanctioned Airbnb. Why would we not want ordinary Cubans to host Americans, get paid money directly by those Americans, and have political discussions with those Americans? Like to me, that that encapsulates the whole problem. And so to me, I think the different differentiation to uh, a Russia, China, or even a Vietnam, is it's much closer, it's much smaller. And by the way, we have a Cuban American population that can, can lead this change. You know, it, it, like it, they, they can bring resources and ideas uh, to Cuba. Um, so I think it's a tragic uh, mistake to, to, to go back to kind of walling this place off. I can tell you from dealing with the Cuban government, they are comfortable they're very comfortable with you know, responding to the, the American state and condemning them and the American financing for uh, a, a small number of oppositionists. Um, they're not comfortable with a flood of Americans traveling. Them. They're not, and the hardliners in Cuba were already pushing back before Obama left because they were so uncomfortable. Thank you for that answer. <laughs> We had several questions about the Middle East. Of course, you were in the Obama administration, uh, part of the response to the Arab Spring period, which resulted in a change of governments and uh, allies such as Egypt and countries such as Tunisia, and also resulted in demonstrations in Syria that led to a civil war that continues to this day. Uh, so, a couple questions related to that. One is Was the Obama administration surprised by the Arab Spring? And was your response to it? appropriate at, at the time to promote democratic change? Was that realistic? And then a question, another question based on Syria is, the decision to not attack Syria, obviously questions of, of war and peace for the administration are difficult. What ultimately made the decision for President Obama to not uh, engage in mass military intervention in Syria? So, I, I think we weren't we weren't surprised by the fact that something <laughs> like the Arab Spring happened. Um, you could feel like a pot 
is boiling and the lid is starting to jangle. The frustration, not just with a lot of political rights, but the frustration with corruption. Um, and I think corruption is the main vulnerability of a lot of these autocratic systems. Um, and the youth population not having expression in society. Um, but the scale and the size of this, when, when the, the, the match was lit, literally in Tunisia, um, when a man self immolated, um, the idea that essentially within you know, two months, the leadership of uh, Egypt, Tunisia, Yemen, um, uh, moving somebody out, you know, would be gone, but that happened faster than we thought. Um, I think, you know, in retrospect, you could feel this at the time, part of what was so uncertain is there were not political institutions, political parties, civil society organizations, there was nothing underneath the autocratic ceiling that had been put on these societies. And so when you removed the leader, well, the only people there to take control were the military. And then you have an election in Egypt and the only people who are organized are the Islamists or the military. And, and so there was, it was very hard to find a footing for the democratic uh, transition. And also what happened, I think, is a, a really a, a counter-revolution. The authoritarians got together. Uh, in many ways, like January 11th is kind of the high point of a certain momentum of history, you know. Obama gets elected, a black man is elected president of the United States from a marginalized, uh, not just a racial background, but socioeconomic background. Like, technologies are connecting people everywhere, they're mobilizing with them. Um, people are in the streets and dislodging dictators in Egypt. I think that that was the moment when the Putins of the world, that the Saudis, the Emiratis, and the kind of autocratic order in that region, were like, that's it, we're, not, we're gonna push back. And we're gonna push back by clearing whatever square fills up with people. We're gonna push back by using these technologies to repress people. You know, because oh, by the way, they can connect people. We can watch who's getting connected and go to the prison. And then we can use the technologies ourselves for disinformation. And so you can in Assad is obviously the most extreme version of this. You can feel the 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 the, the force of an, of an establishment, threat of establishment pushing back. And you know, I I wish that there was more that we could have done differently. Um, it may not have led to a different experience. Um, I think in places like Egypt and Libya, where you had some opening, um, clearly we did not find the formula to push to that. Um, I also would be lying if I had said, you know, which a lot of former officials do. Well, I had, you know, they don't think they listen to me, you know, because uh, you know, I actually think that structurally these, these are changes they compared over time. And what I always say to people is it looks settled now. Ask me what Egypt looks like in 10 years, because I'm not certain that the status quo is not going to blow again. And the second time it blows, hopefully you've learned the lessons from the first time to, to do better. Syria obviously becomes the most acute manifestation of this. And I was a, a constant advocate to do more. I wanted to, I, I wanted to just do something, right? Um, and when the chemical weapons attack happened, I remember thinking, you know, okay, now we're going to do something. You know, and, and it was clear to me that we would lose military force. Um, what President Obama, I, I'll give the short answer to this, you know, he starts pulling the thread on this. And part of what he realizes is, is okay, if we bomb them, if we like launch a cruise missile strike, nothing's going to change. So that's not going to surrender. He may use chemical weapons again. We can't blow up the chemical weapons because we don't do that because it sends chemical weapons in the air. Um, and so what he realized is, okay, if I initiate a military action against Assad, I'm either going to just do a one-off strike that doesn't change anything, which is what Trump ended up actually doing, or you know, there's going to be a logic that gets me deeper and deeper into this. And I can't do that without a national support or congressional support. And so what people forget is that the reason he didn't take the strike is he said, I won't do it without congressional authorization because I don't want to be out on my limb where I'm taking military strikes with no authorization, and I'm getting criticized by the same members of Congress for saying I have to do something. Because, you know, so he basically wanted to test what is our appetite after Iraq and Afghanistan for getting into another war. And the congressional support <coughs> evaporated immediately, including some hawks who found important reasons not to support it. And so his main answer was like, we can't get into another war after you know the last three. Um, and, and pretend like some cruise missiles are going to dislodge Assad. If we're in, we're in. 
And if the country's not with me and the Congress isn't with me, and I have no allies with me, other than France is only one who's willing to join, it will fit. I'll get involved in the failed military endeavor. It won't solve the humanitarian situation. Now, all that said, I couldn't argue with his logic. Um, I can still argue with the state that we should have done something. Um, the velocity of criticism that we faced for doing nothing had a cost of its own, right? Um, uh, but that was, his logic was essentially like, when are we going to do the US military intervention in the East and not automatically make things better? And actually, if you look at Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya, objectively, it can make things worse, including from a humanitarian perspective. And so I'm not going to start the fourth war in the Middle East without any support. And it, it was a hard position to argue. Ben, we actually have Pete Rouse and Card at the same event, and neither of them made any mistakes in the entire time of office. Feel free to throw darts at other people. Uh, I want to switch more to a, a couple questions that are kind of, again, merging ideas here. But there was a lot of talk during the Obama years about the Asian pivot, turning for yeah. more of our attention we focus on, on uh, Asia, but the criticism of that, of course, is that there wasn't full attention on Europe, which is now we see what's happened in Europe, the Middle East, which was, of course, even if you wanted to get out, there were all these conflicts going on, including broader Middle East, two, two hot wars. And then closer in the Western Hemisphere, where Latin America, uh, a lot of people who follow Latin American issues feel that it's frequently forgotten the foreign policy, at least in terms of I'm going to start with Latin America because it's been a mistake. I mean, I feel that. And, and look, I got to say, in part, um, if you treat the whole region as, um, as about just Cuba, um, you know, that you're missing a lot. It's happening. And, and part of what happened on the back end of the normalization. We negotiated a Columbia peace deal. In event, right? That was easier to do on the back end of, uh, of that. Um, we had, I think, in a weird way, and I'll just say this too, Carter, like, look at the trajectory of left-wing authoritarianism in Latin America by the end of the years. It was going down, right? Like those people depend upon the conflict of the United States like they depend upon oxygen. And when you remove that oxygen, you start, they were flailing. The left regenerated in the Trump years. <laughs> like this isn't rocket science. And, and so to me, I think what part of what we were trying to do is just kind of reset the whole dynamic in Latin America. Hey, we're here to solve problems. We're going to promote democracy. We're going to promote human rights. Um, we're going to promote uh, clean energy. We're going to promote uh, secure, secure, secure migration, all these things. Um, we, we have an agenda that is bigger than this, this constant fight we're in with a handful of leaders down. And frankly, and I'm saying that not because I approve of those leaders, but because I frankly think the fight serves the interests of those leaders more than it, it undermines, right? So I think we do need to get to a different paradigm where we're engaging on America as equals, by the way, um, to just solve the problems in our hands and not to, to, to be kind of permanently in the same fight. Now, globally, there's a similar answer in a way. The pivot to Asia, we meant it as a pivot away from the Middle East and the war in terror more than Europe. And if I find fault with what we did, the irony to me is like a lot of what we did that I, I wish we'd done differently were things that prolonged you know, the Afghan surge, um, the kind of tolerance of, of Saudi policy in Yemen, things that kept us in the Middle East, what I find vulnerable. But I think this is the, it's the wrong framework. It's a tie to what I was saying earlier. I don't think it's about pivoting to a region. I think it's about pivoting to issues. What are the issues of your focus? Because they're, they're like you can't solve the future of how artificial intelligence is going to reshape the world in Asia or in Europe. It encompasses both. 
can't solve the danger of disinformation on social media platforms <coughs> in one region. It has to be done starting here and globally. You certainly can't solve climate change just in Asia, right? So like, to me, the issue set that defines, you can define the lives of most of uh, us in this room, climate change, technology, the survivability of democracy, these are issues in Latin America and Asia and Europe. And, and so I actually think that it's less about which set of countries are we spending more time thinking about and more about like what issues are we working on across the board globally. Um, and we're gonna have different partners in different regions, um, depending on the issue. I'm glad change, of course. There's been a lot of talk about how important it is to the years we people see, see the science, people see the policy, President Obama talked about it a lot. And again, I'm paraphrasing the questions. Was there any real progress in climate change in the U.S.? And what will it take to have a consensus that actually results in sustained change and not just when gas prices are over $5? Well, I think there was enormous progress in the Obama years, even if it's not sufficient. Um, and, and I'll do the word, quick version of the domestic and the farm. Domestically, part of what happened is the combination of an initial $80 billion investment in renewable energies in the, in the first Obama stimulus, that created a wind and solar industry in this country that actually far, far outperformed even our wildest expectations. Like once you see the money and show profitability, then the markets come in and say, okay, we're gonna start investing in these technologies. When you couple that with regulations, like fuel efficiency standards for cars, and the automakers are looking at this and saying, well, it's moving in this direction. So we're just going to start building electric vehicles and we're going to start building you know, more energy efficient cars. And then you couple that with the regulation around power plants and, and fossil fuels. And, and, and government, through a minimum amount of action, not as much as that would like, I would like to think of that really ambitious legislation, but just through that combination of investment, regulation, then states and cities start to correct, and then markets start to correct. And, and the United States met its Paris Climate Accord objectives, even with Trump pulling out, because states and cities and companies had already adjusted and money was beginning to invest, you know, investments. So it was a, a real pivot, <laughs> to use that word, um, in terms of American energy, even as we're doing too much fossil fuel production, and even as people <coughs> right to criticize you know, uh, things in the Obama years in terms of fossil production, the, the creation of the alternative happened in those years. And then globally, I think what people need to recognize is what you're just trying to do is bring about the tipping point. What is going to protect the planet for people here? It's going to basically mean if the world ends its dependence on fossil fuels and wires an entire global economy that runs on different sources of energy. And you just need enough countries doing enough with the sufficient ambition to basically completely disincentivize any future production or investment in fossil fuels because that's just not the future. And you need to accelerate that as fast as you can. Um, and if I was a climate activist, I'd be completely furious at the, the, the speed at which it's moving because it's it's moving at a glacial pace, pardon the, the pun. Um, but it's it's possible. It is possible. Like it, it, you need to create that tipping point where you know, even if there's an outlier like Russia or Saudi Arabia, if, if everybody else is moving this other direction, then the kind of virtuous cycle takes over where, and, and people can roll their eyes at the climate finance. But it, it is the case that if all the money starts going to remove lenders, that's a good thing, right? But we're not doing enough to, to force that to happen yet. I think if we continue the trajectory of Saudi Obama years and have a Congress that could pass legislation, the United States is big enough in the global economy to kind of force that change. We've got, we've got time just for a couple more questions. So I know one of the other issues you worked extensively on was Iran, which we've not um, talked about at all. Uh, both those agreements, Cuba and Iran, were the Trump administration reversed positions from what you worked on. So questions both for the agreement and against it were, were uh, registered. So I wanted to ask you, uh, what does it say about the United States word if agreements that are signed by the United States are uh, 
done away with in a relatively short order. Yeah, I mean, especially when we're talking about climate change. Yeah, no, I think it's incredibly important because, yeah, we can talk about, I mean, I would make the point that when we had the Iran deal in place, Iran rolled back its nuclear program and, and had inspectors in all the nuclear facilities, and then we got rid of that deal, and now they're advancing their nuclear program, and we had no inspectors in the nuclear facilities. Like, one seems logically better than the other to me. Um, but putting that aside, even if you don't like the Iran deal, I think part of what people have to recognize is we as a country, we have friends who shift priorities, but we tend to stick to agreements. There are guardrails around how fast the pendulum can swing back and forth. People have to realize it took us seven years to get the money. Years of getting allies of Europe to impose sanctions with us, enforce those sanctions, negotiate, relax those sanctions. It took seven years to get the Paris Agreement. Years of just strong arming other countries to make emissions reduction commitments and change how they're approaching energy. It took years to get the Cuban government um, to a place where, like, literally, you know, it's a they saw what we were doing as a Trojan horse, you know. So, like, it wasn't obvious to them that they would want Americans traveling down there and want internet. And, and the problem is, <coughs> never before in American history have you seen this dramatic. It, it'd be like if Barack Obama got, came in office and the next day removed every troop from Iraq because he opposed the election. You know, like that, that's not what we did. That's not how it works. Like, and, and the problem is, and it speaks to what I was getting at earlier about like the, the viability of our model. Why would any government, I went to Glasgow, with, we didn't make much progress in Glasgow. Why would we? Because all these countries are listening to John Kerry, who have tremendous admiration for, say, here's why you got to get off methane. Here's why you got to do this. And they're looking at John Kerry and they're seeing Donald Trump right over shoulder. Like, okay, if I go along with the Americans and do all these economically difficult things, and then in three years, like, if Trump is back and just tears it up, what's the point of that? Or, like, look how hard it's been for them to just get back in the Iran deal, because the Iranians are saying, well, why should we do this when if you guys lose the next election, some guys are just going to tear it up? Or if you didn't like the deal that we got on Cuba, try to get the next, right? Like, like the... the if our word means nothing, if signed agreements mean nothing, good luck conducting foreign policy. And guess who keeps their agreements over time? The Chinese, right? And, and so I think this is a huge issue. And it, it's been a real problem for the Biden administration to, to wrestle with, which is that, like, if people think that we are going to go from, you know, 180 degree shifts every four years and, and a painstakingly detailed agreement. And just get ripped up because it makes for a good, you know, uh, TV appearance for the next president. You can't run a superpower like that. You just can't. We're putting ourselves out of business. The United States, of course, has had, uh, had human rights as a plank of its foreign policy since, since the Carter administration and democracy promotion of various forms by various administrations over the last 30 years, if not longer. Um, so my question is to you is, do we continue to pr pursue a values-based foreign policy or do we take an approach that's more transactional in nature? And those who would take a transactional approach, who, who you know, the Trump administration tended to say, would also say that they accomplished more by befriending some of these countries that do have poor human rights records and are not democratic. So I'd like you to comment a little bit about that. I, number one, the most important way we can promote democracy is by being in democracy. Um, that's what won the poll. You know, it wasn't just going around lecturing people. It was just like people thought that our way of life looked more attractive than the Soviet Union. And, and things like the civil rights movement were hugely important to the uh, You know, our capacity to use democracy to try to improve things here. Um, what I, I talk to dissidents around the world, and they constantly tell me the same thing. Like, the example you set is the most important thing that you can do. Second point is, I would like to see us not be such a bunch of ridiculous hypocrites when it comes to these issues. I would like to see us, you're not going to achieve perfect consistency in the world. But whatever transaction you're winning, with Mohammed bin Salman is not worth it. 
Shame on us, Nibami, for you know getting involved in his war in Yemen. Just for what reason? Right? Because they're major world producers. Let's be honest. About it. Okay, so what did Trump get out of the transaction? The Saudis bought a bunch of military equipment and they pumped some more. Well, the military equipment is contributing to the proxy wars in the Middle East that draw America in. And pumping oil is contributing to the climate change that's going to make the planet inhabitable. Those are not transactions that are worth trading away your values. And so I'd say that's it. I, like, look at what happened on Ukraine. You know, the reports are like Biden couldn't even get his phone call returned by mom and son. Well, yeah. Why would that guy want to bail us? He's on the wrong side of history. If we really think that this is about, and this gets back to what I was saying about Zelensky, if we really think that we are in a struggle between democracies and autocracies, which you hear constantly in this situation, how can you win that struggle if Mohammed Salman's on your team? Well, I want to thank you so much, Ben. I, I'd also say you you more comfortable to wear a t shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're not done. I have to say, you picked me up in the car and I wasn't wearing a tie, and I was like, I gotta, I gotta throw it on this tie. So, well, if I have to wear it, you have to wear it. So, that's awesome. I'd uh, like us all to give a hand and. Uh,